In this video, we're going to introduce you to some key ideas that'll help you when you start creating 3D models in Aspire. The 3D objects in the software are represented by a grid of points, each one of which can be at a different Z height. A good way to think of this is like a very dense version of one of these pin art executive toys. Typically within the software you won't be able to see the individual pins like you can see in these but the way that the 3D objects are represented is very similar. The main difference really is the fact that we have the opportunity to use so many points within our model. In Aspire we'll use a minimum of a million points and so we can represent much more complex and smooth forms within the software. Within the context of the software and the documentation you'll typically hear us refer to these points as pixels. And this is the same terminology that you'd hear people use about a computer image. And in actual fact, the concept is very similar in terms of the number of pixels is often going to affect the quality of the image, or in our case, the 3D model. Within Aspire, one of the settings that will determine this quality is called the resolution. We set this when we do our initial job setup. This is the form where we specify the size and the origin position in relation to what we're going to put on the CNC. You can see towards the bottom of the form here, highlighted by this red rectangle, an area called modeling resolution. Within there, we can choose from three options. We have the standard resolution, that means that our part will have one million pixels in it. We have high resolution, which is two million pixels, or very high resolution, which is four million pixels. And these will be uh, evenly distributed across whatever the size of our part is in a grid. As you'd expect, if you choose more pixels, the better quality your model is likely to be. But the trade-off for this is potentially longer calculation times when you're calculating the 3D shapes or when you're calculating a toolpath. So the idea is that you choose something that balances how fast your computer hardware is with the type of job you're trying to do. It's important to note that even in Aspire, the resolution does not affect jobs that only have 2D or 2.5D content. So if you're working on a part that doesn't require a 3D model, then you won't need to worry about the resolution setting. The idea of resolution and these number of pixels affecting the 3D model can be quite abstract, especially when you're new to this type of software. It is an important concept though, and once you've started watching some of the tutorials and tried the modeling yourself, we'd recommend that if you wanted to learn more about it, looking at the modeling concepts video that's included with the tutorials, or looking on the FAQ section of the support website and typing in resolution as a keyword. Here, what I'd like to do is just give you a few um, quick and easy ideas that you can incorporate when you set your work up that'll help you as you first start to work with the software without having to be an expert on this subject. A simple way to think of resolution is the more points or pixels that you have under your 3D part, the better quality it's going to be. So you want to maximize the area of the job that your 3D part covers. The best way to do this is when you do your job setup within the software to make that area only slightly larger than the part you actually plan to machine. A good rule of thumb on a typical job in Aspire would maybe to leave an additional inch or 25 millimeters if you're working in metric around the outside of your job. This in most cases is going to leave enough space for the cutout tool to profile around it but obviously if you do choose a value it needs to be appropriate to what you're doing and you do need to make sure it safely contains all your toolpaths. A common mistake that you do want to avoid is not to make your job size the size of your table or your material unless the job you're doing is actually that size. In the example shown on the slide here you can see the same horse's head in two different size job setups. In the top here, the horse, which is about 10 inches across, is in a job setup which is maybe 12 inches across. So we've just left a small gap around the outside of the part. And on the right, we can see what the 3D model looks like at that particular job size and resolution. 
At the bottom here, we've got the same resolution, but now we've set the whole job up to be a 4x8 sheet of material. So our 10 inch horse head only occupies a small part of this and as such is covering much less of the points or the pixels that we have in the model to define our 3D object. As such, you can see over on the right here that the pixelation or the quality of this is much worse in this second job. So this is why it's so important that when you do your job setup, it's only slightly larger than the part you plan to cut and not the full size of your machine or material, as I said, unless that's the size of the part you are actually cutting, in which case you'd expect to see the horse taking up much more of the room here. In some cases, depending on the shape of the job you're cutting, you might also benefit by rotating the part to better fit the rectangular or square shape of material that we set up within a spire. So we've discussed this idea that our model is represented by this grid of pixels, each of which has its own z-height. The good news is that for the majority of the time we really don't need to worry about that. The pixel heights themselves are set by creating 3D shapes within the software that we call components. These components are managed in an area of the modeling tab called the component tree and you can see that highlighted in the slide here with the red rectangle. The components in the component tree combine together to make something called the composite model. This is what the software uses when any 3D toolpath is calculated. It may be made up of just a single component within the tree, or a more complex model might be a combination of many different components or groups of components. Ultimately, the composite model is what's displayed in the 3D view. Throughout the modeling tutorials, you'll see examples of how the component tree is used to create different composite models. There's also a video tutorial that's dedicated to the component tree if you want to see a detailed look at all the different controls that you have within there for managing components. So now we have this idea of 3D objects or components in Aspire, we need to understand how they're created. Our first option would be to use the modeling tools within Aspire itself. You can see the icons for those highlighted here on the slide and they include Create Shape, Extrude and Weave, Two Rail Sweep, Sculpting and Create Model from Image. The other method would be to import an existing 3D model. This may be something that you'd previously made in Aspire, it may be a piece of 3D clip art that you've downloaded from the web, or it might be a 3D model that's been created in another CAD software program, perhaps by your customer or maybe by yourself. All these different methods to create components will be covered extensively throughout the 3D modeling tutorials. Now let's continue by looking at the typical workflow or process when you're creating a 3D object within Aspire. The first stage of any job, whether it's 2D or 3D, is to define the job concept. That may mean assembling reference material, making sketches, getting files off your customer, something like that so you have a good idea of what you're planning to make and have spent some time thinking about that and the different processes that will be involved. Stage two would be to make a really good quality set of vectors. You may have data that you can import into the software in order to help you achieve this. Stage three would be to start to build the basic components of your 3D model using the modeling tools that we were just talking about within the software. And depending on the complexity of the part will depend how many of these basic shapes you may need to build. As you create them though, you'll go into stage four, which will be to edit and organize the components. That may be combining them in sub-assemblies or groups of components, it may be adjusting the order and combine modes in the component tree so that you get different results as the components combine with each other, or it may be using some of the other tools within Aspire like the sculpting or some of the component editing tools. Depending on the complexity of the job, you may find you need to iterate back through steps 2, 3 and 4 in order to create additional shapes and do additional editing 
until you're ready to do the final finish operations, such as one last sculpt, smooth, or maybe creating uh, vectors around the outside of your 3D objects that you'll be able to use as a machining border. Ultimately, once we've completed all these tasks, and we're happy with how our composite model looks in the 3D view, we're ready to think about how we take this virtual model and turn it into a real 3D object. We typically use two types of toolpath to cut a 3D part. The first of these, the 3D roughing, normally uses a larger tool and is designed to remove the majority of the material around our 3D objects. This will make it safer for us to go in with a smaller tool when we do the finishing. Once the roughing is complete, we'll in effect be left with a skin over the top of our part that's ready for us to do our final toolpath, which is our 3D finishing. This toolpath is designed to cut the finished surface of the model, so typically it's going to use a small ball nose cutter or round ended cutter and it will go back and forward over the job with a small step in between each pass that it makes so that you get a nice smooth finish. In addition to the 3D toolpath to actually create the modelled surface, you may also combine the model with 2D and 2.5D toolpaths. A simple example of that might be using a vector and creating a profile toolpath in order to cut the 3D part out. A slightly more advanced version of that is that some 2D and 2.5D toolpaths can be projected onto the 3D shape, for example perhaps to engrave some text that follows the 3D surface. All the different types of toolpaths and ways to combine them with 3D models are covered throughout the tutorials. Before we finish this video, it's worth mentioning that as well as using the model to create toolpaths in order to run the part on a CNC, which is typically what Aspire is used for, it's also possible to export 3D data from the software, perhaps to import into another 3D design program or even to send to a 3D printer. So that concludes this introduction to some of the important ideas that you need to be aware of as you start to create and work with 3D models within Aspire. Thank you for watching the video.